welcome to this week's episode of the Everything Went Black podcast. Please welcome Dana Schechter of Insect Arc and Swans. Insect Arc has a new record this year called Raw Blood Singing. And if any of you have uh, been following the band and haven't checked this record out yet, do yourself a favor right away and check it out. It's great. Very different. It's got vocals and uh, you know most of the other material, the older material, is instrumental. Uh, so I look forward to catching them live at some point. Uh, different lineup, you know, it's a three-piece instead of a two-piece. Very interesting. So check it out. We have a great conversation about the band, about Swans, and about uh, the Brooklyn days. As you know, I am a member of an elite group of content creators known as the Horsemen of the Podcasting Apocalypse. Kicking things off every other Monday, we have Horror Wolf 666, brought to you by Brandon Legion. Tuesday, Into the Necrosphere deploys, brought to you by Jackie Smith. Wednesday is a Horseman double shot, with of course Everything Went Black, which you're listening to right now. Iblis Manifestations, brought to you by Cheyenne. And congratulations, Cheyenne, for uh, Trivax signing to Osmos, a legendary label, and I wish you all the luck. Thursday is another double shot with Necromaniac's Horror Podcast, where I return along with Jeff Kashid and Mike Scandato. We also get Day One of Soul Knox, brought to you by Carl Hikara. Friday, Spitball Media comes at you, featuring Mike Scandato's brother, John Draper. Saturday is finally a day off. After all this hard work that we're putting in, we get a day off. However, Sunday, Carl returns with day two of Soul Knox. Carl and I are doing a collaboration called Darkness Weaves, where we discuss the work of Carl Edward Wagner. And every other month, we switch off which podcast hosts the show. Right now, we're working on the Kane short stories, and um, yeah, it's been great. If you want to support the show, by all means, tell your friends, give us a review on uh, Apple or whatever platform you listen on. But if you really want to go a step further, you can join the Everything Went Black Patreon. For as little as $1 a month, you get access to the weekly bonus content. For $5 a month, you get all the bonus content plus early access to the regular episodes. And for $25, you can become a sponsor. Welcome to the show, Dana. Um, It's been a while since we spoke, so how have we been? Hey, Mike. Thanks for having me. Um, Yeah, I'm doing really good. Thank you. It's a beautiful day here in Berlin. The last time I saw you, you were getting ready to make the big final move over to Berlin. Uh, so I'm assuming everything went smoothly since uh, <laughs> we haven't heard any reports from you or anything like that. Yeah, I mean, I didn't really need, n- intend to move here. I mean, I had lived here before, so I still had remnants of a life here. But I did come back to New York for a little bit before, you know, just kind of saying adios to New York. And it's been, well, I've been living here for four years now, so... I have to say, uh, this year's record, Blood Singing, it's been, uh, you know, a pretty steady uh, spin here at the uh, the compound. So uh, congratulations on the new record. Thank you so much. I'm glad that you like it. And I have to say, it's also uh, a lot of differences in, this, in the other material that's out. Well, the, the primary one is the, the presence of vocals. So what, what made you decide to do that? I mean, most of the insect arc material is instrumental. That's right. The decision to do that was multi multifold, I would say. Uh, I will just go back by saying that when I did the first recording ever with Insect Arc, there were vocals. And when I started the project as a solo project, I was playing bass and lap steel and singing and doing all this programming. And um, I sort of quickly realized that I couldn't really pull all of that off and do it well. And I had been a singer before in my old band, which was called Be and Flower. Um, and I never was really comfortable as a singer and as a front person, but I, I mean, I liked the sound of my voice, but I didn't feel that I had the control 
and the uh, necessary sort of <laughs> bravado to be anything like a front person. And uh, I thought, okay, I'm gonna just concentrate on playing lap steel and bass and doing this drum programming. And then eventually over time, you know, the project evolved a lot since it being just me by myself playing everything. And, you know, for this new record, so many other things had shifted. I had moved from the US to Europe. I started playing with Tim Wiskita on drums. Tim, who many people know from Con 8 and Blind Idiot God, and he moved here right after COVID when I had stopped um, working with Andy Patterson, who was the previous drummer in Insect Dark. And it was all COVID-y and screwed up and Andy couldn't really swing doing a long distance project. And so I was looking for a drummer and Tim ended up sliding in. He ended up joining the band. Um, he encouraged me to sing again. Uh, our old manager, Nikos, was uh, encouraging me to sing. Other people were asking me, why don't you sing? Why don't you sing? And But I would say that in general, that the real factor was that I felt I had an opportunity to readapt and refocus on what I wanted to do creatively. And I thought that it would be an interesting uh, different, like sonically interesting to involve human voice again. So I kind of went into it with some trepidation, but I feel really good about it now. So I enjoy, I'm actually enjoying singing, which I didn't think would ever happen. Yeah, it's interesting because, uh, you know, obviously the music is very, you know, it's, it's the same band, you know, the same sort of vibe, but the addition of vocals. It's like it makes it sound like a, a fresh new project, you know, because it's just it's just so different, you know, from uh, the listener standpoint. And um, yeah. So when you know with the touring, how, like you, know, you 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 cover a lot of bases on stage, you know. Like when I've seen you guys play, there's all different things going on. Mm -hmm. How does that work out? I mean, you're playing live. So yeah, well, I mean. It's also the live situation also took a lot of twists and turns. So it started out me by myself with a million cables and way too much gear. And then um, I had, you know, started playing with drummers. And um, now when this material was developed and we decided to give it a shot with vocals, and then it was clear that this was a good direction to follow. And we all agreed that it was going to be, it was going to be cool and it was time for a change. Um, the obvious situation was is that I was not going to be able to play lap steel and bass and do all this insane live looping and jumping around and switching mid song and having this very complex pedal setup that was just really elaborate and very involved that I wasn't going to be able to add vocals on top of that. So the obvious solution was to get a third member for live shows. And so now since the new album came out, I believe we've done five shows as a trio. And there's a fellow named Lynn Wright, who is also an expat from New York who lives in Berlin. And he and I played in that band B and flower together. And so he's a great musician and he basically has learned all of my lap steel parts. So the album was just me and Tim. I played lap steel, bass, synth, you know, all this other stuff. To, Tim did drums. Uh, and as much as I love playing lap steel and I play lap steel and bass and swans, I just knew like, okay, if I'm going to actually sing and I'm going to do a good job at this, then from a live standpoint, I want to be able to present a good show. So let's not spread ourselves or in this case myself so thin that I am unable to even consider, you know, the fact that I'm on a stage in front of people and um, be, you know, relaxed and be focused. Cause as many musicians know, particularly ones who play an instrument and sing, it's really, it's quite challenging. And if you're playing bass, I think it's even a little bit harder. Um, so we've been doing the shows as a trio and we'll continue that way. And I think it's it's coming together really nicely. So 
going to continue that way. Yeah, that, that was my, my first, because I, I didn't realize you added another member for performing live. Mm -hmm. It's you know, relatively new. So uh, the only time right. I've seen you play was as a, as a two-piece, you know, different drummers and all that mm -hmm. stuff. So, and, and even as a two-piece, I was like, how the hell does she pull all this stuff off, man? Because like, for me, I can barely play guitar and sing at the same time. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I, I mean, I, luckily I have another <laughs> guitar player because it, it hide all my mistakes I make when I'm playing. But like the... Uh, it just seems like with the even on a technical level too, like the pedals and all that, and just oh yeah, you know it's it's very challenging. And then when I first started getting into the album, I was like, huh, how is this going to work? You know, like, yeah. And especially <laughs> like the lap steel, um, you and I have actually had this discussion a while ago about lap steel and how it mm -hmm. is a very, uh, you know, there, there's a very intuitive kind of uh, personal characteristic to it. And uh, yeah. to have someone else like, like someone else interpreting that, like even even you even mentioned yourself that even trying to reproduce your own parts sometimes they come out very different. Oh so, yeah, yeah. Having like a, a whole other person playing your parts, like you know, is is there a control thing going on? Like, how do you feel about that? Like, what's what's your what's your sort of emotional impact with all that? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, well, particularly because lap steel is a fretless instrument, I think it really um, makes for an even more very personal sensibility to how you play the instrument. Because with the absence of frets um, and combining that with a lot of slides and you know, how fast do you slide from a note to the next and do you, do you go really slow or do you kind of fly over it? And it's so bendy and twisty, and the instrument itself is just really hard to play. It's just yes. like trying to play a bunch of like electric rubber bands. That's what it feels like when you first play. It, is like squeals and you know, kind of like sick cow sounds. And eventually, you know, you make your way with it. But in this case, Lynn is uh, Lynn Wright. He's a really great guitar player, and he plays lap steel already. So. You know, we sat down and I basically gave him multi-track recordings where he was able to isolate the lap steel parts and play along to it. And then just the way that you learn anybody else's stuff, just through re repetition, you know, I gave him some chord charts and he spent a lot of time on his own. And then, you know, as needed, um, some stuff he nailed it immediately and other stuff just due to our differences in our playing style. I said, oh, you know, I think on this one, maybe you need to like slam it a little bit harder because I, you know, I'm a bass player. So I play lap steel, uh, even in swans often with a bass pick uh, in my right hand. And so that's, you know, and I'm, I hit it really hard. My lap steel's like got very heavy strings on it so that it can handle that kind of abuse. And um, he's a much more subtle and refined musician. So I've had to sometimes say to him like, I think, you know, maybe if you hit this a little bit harder, it's going to get that tone that we're looking for. And but he's he's matched my pedal setup. So um, sonically, it's pretty close. And he's actually using my lap steel as well, because it's just right. that's what the sound of the instrument. And we tried to get his lap steel to sound that way, and it just it, it didn't. So um but yeah, I mean, with a lot of patience, you know, and a lot of a lot of kudos to him for dealing with me when I'm sort of like, ah, oh, it's not right. You know, sometimes I don't know what it is. And he's like, look, I'm playing it like this. And then I'm like, yep, that sounds exactly right. And then what is it? It's like microtonal bends. It's light adjustments and timing. It's slow music and slow music with a lot of like slides on a fretless instrument just there's a lot of variation in the expression and particularly with the left hand. Um, so we did a lot of rehearsals before we played a show. And, you know, now I think after a couple shows, it's starting to really come together. And the last few we've done have felt really, really like the power is there, the tone is there and the expression is coming through and I'm having fun just playing bass and singing. So it's been going great. That's awesome, man. It's uh, 
Now, with with singing and playing bass, uh, you know, like bass, you know, is a rhythmic instrument, and vocal is a harmonic, you know, sort of melodic instrument. Okay, so mm -hmm. playing bass and singing at the same time, do they? Do you find like that your vocal patterns kind of fall into the rhythm, or or you have detached yourself from the rhythm and able to kind of work more melodically live? Like on the record, yes, I can hear all that stuff, but when you play live. The tendency sometimes, you know, is to hit those, lock into the rhythm, I guess. Yeah. Well, yeah. So um, in this case, I had the the idea in mind that I was going to write vocals to songs that were already written. So the material was more or less written before I thought about adding vocals. We were like, okay, we're going to make this record. Got these songs. We were working on the songs. And then this was like, all right, I'm going to try adding vocals. And I thought like, hmm, well, wouldn't it be smart for me to write vocals that, uh, you know, don't write a like complicated vocal line over a syncopated bass run, you know, because it's just going to be really hard. So I tried to write vocals that I still thought were interesting and had the qualities that I wanted, but didn't interfere with my ability to, you know, sing and play at the same time. So in some cases I ended up, doing things that required a lot of repetition for me to get my muscle memory with, you know, with the bass and to be able to still really focus on the voice. But there's a lot of stuff where I'm just holding bass chords and I'm doing, you know, a lot of slides and holding whole notes and stuff like that and leaving room for the vocals, which turns out actually by leaving lots of space, then you have, you know, rhythmic and harmonic, um, and frequency separation so the things feel really open and minimal and spacious which is those are all really important things to to me and to tim with this music is that it has this sort of vast space so if you don't jam everything up on each other um and give things a chance to breathe one way to do that is to not layer it up so much um, so in most cases we work that way. And I think it's, it's an interesting thing. Cause I'm sure you know this from trying to sing and play like, you, you know, you, I don't know if for you personally, if you like write a riff on the guitar and then you write a vocal line and then you're like, shit, like this is really hard <laughs> to yeah. pull off. So I thought like, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to make it a little easier on myself. Yeah, I, I cheat a lot because I I'll, I'll, I got the benefit of having a second guitar player. So I'm like, I'll, I'll make a demo and it's like, all right, cool. I have this, I'm going to rock out in this chord over here. Mm -hmm. This other part is that like, you're going to play that part. <laughs> so it's like, right. I don't have to worry about playing the, you know, the, the uh, arpeggios or anything like that. So this other guy can do that, you know? So, yeah. Right. And that's good too. I mean, it's an interesting thing to make creative decisions with performance in mind because I always felt like, well, you know, I don't feel that you have to do a live interpretation the same as a recording. It's cool if you can pull stuff off, but I also feel that reinterpreting things for live is also a very interesting way to approach it because, yeah, some people want to hear things because they get attached to how something sounds exactly and they're um they really want to bring that to life in a live situation and of course there's nothing wrong with that but i feel that as long as something works musically and it's really engaging and it sounds cool then if you have to change it for a live scenario uh as long as the music isn't suffering you know if somebody had never heard the song and you did a reinterpretation of it and they're like yeah that was cool like they wouldn't know that something was different Actually, some of my favorite bands are like that. You know, obviously Neurosis, the another mm -hmm. band you play in, Swans is the same sort of thing. You know, it's oh yeah, it's like a almost like a a Sun Ra sort of you know scenario with Swans. Sometimes you know when I see them live, Swans um, hasn't played. I mean, we just did like a year of touring, right? And we made the record first, and we did not play anything live that that sounded like the album. Yeah. Um, and the longer the tour went, the less it sounded like the album. There was one song 
called Cathedrals of Heaven that we were doing. I mean, the tour lasted a year, so I think there was six tours in there. And I think on the first, like, two tours, and when I say a tour, I mean, like, um, like a region, you know, like, like the North America tour or a Europe tour or whatever. Um, we were doing that song, and it was kind of close to the album version. But, you know, Michael Gerard does not give any he doesn't care he's not interested in repeating himself and by the time something's done and ready to be performed live he's already kind of had some ideas about how he can play with it or change it so um sometimes there's fans like ah oh, i didn't even i wouldn't even have known that that was the same song except for i recognized the lyrics um but then sometimes those re-adaptations of a song they change so much that they actually become the the basis for a new piece of work with new lyrics and then that's a new song for the next record. That's why it's important to see Swans live, I think, you know. Yeah. Yeah, for, for me personally. I tried to I mean I missed I missed uh, the the show um the last time. Uh, mm. Because but that's ever every other time I think I've I've been at the show and it's always different and uh and like you know, like you mentioned, sometimes it's hard to tell what's going on. Like, what song is this? And then you catch a line here and there, and it's like, oh, it's this, but yeah. it's different. Oh, you know, and it's totally like, not clear. Yeah. yeah, you know, but it's like you you gear yourself up knowing that you're going in for an experience, you know, and it's not necessarily like a rundown of the hits, you know, which is like, which is fine for other bands, but when you get to Swans, it's like I'm going there for the whole thing, and I got to take the whole thing in and, and absorb it and reflect on it later and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think that's the only way to take it because it's just, I think that the chance of, you know, playing old songs in their old format, it just, just doesn't happen. Uh, so. Just back to uh, Insect Art for a second. Um, sure. The uh, You guys work with uh, Deborah Mamorte on this, uh, Deborah Mamorte on this record. And uh, mm -hmm. it's yeah. licensed though, right? Or, or is it, how did, how did you uh, meet up with that label? That's a great label, by the way. I'm a big fan. Oh, a lot cool. Of they have. Yeah, right on. Yeah, likewise. Um, that connection happened because there is an artist on the label called Mutterline, which is a one woman project from France. And Somebody clued me on to her a while ago and I started listening and I was like, holy crap, this is so good. I love it. And it's, um, yeah, it's, well, it's just, it's just really, really dark and really expressive and it's not metal, you know, I don't want to like pin a name on what it is, but I'm a fan. And, um, I found out about her because she was doing a tour with Alec Tadolo, this band from France, who are friends and who I'm a fan of. And uh, I saw that they announced this tour with her playing and I was like, huh, who is this? And I was like, holy shit, this is amazing. So we ended up playing a festival in France together a couple of years ago and she and I met and I said, you know, it'd be great sometime to do something together or whatever. And we stayed in touch. And then when we finished this album, I wrote her and I said, hey, would you, you know, I'd like to send it to you and see what you think. And and do you think that you would be willing to introduce us to Deborah Marmorty? And she said, oh yeah, of course. And so she did. And much to our surprise, even though it's, you know, it's certainly not like a normal Deborah Marmorty release, but they have a tendency to put out records that they love, like that's their criteria. And so um, it ended up working out. Yeah, that's that's killer. I mean, th th that's that's the thing about um, you know, sort of the the uh, labels like that, you know, which are a lot of the, a lot of mostly black metal. But I feel like black metal fans and people who make that music have a wider bandwidth of influences and likes and loves and things like that. And it, and to me, I'm like, oh wow, cool. This makes sense. I mean, I love. You know, bands like Eccles and all that sort of stuff too. You know, very extreme, but also there's all that stuff makes sense to me that it's packaged in the same group. You know what I'm trying to say? Mm -hmm. I do. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think this is one of the the things that a a smaller independent label still has the opportunity to do is to 
kind of see all the different facets of heavy extreme music and you know the common thread is is you know perhaps quality or a sense of a vibe or that there's an emotional underlying factor or you know there's a lot of there's a lot of things that tie things together beyond just if something is you know black metal speed metal death metal thrash metal doom metal you know i mean and we've always had this situation with insect art that we don't really fit in a category and while that was sort of the case before i think even now it's more the case with folks that vocals on the album are pretty melodic with some very strong hooks that kind of you know, get, get under your skin. And um, that's something that I always found to do as a, as a writer, is I try to come up with stuff that's really subversive, but also just really uh, catchy, not in a pop way, but just that it's such a strong melody, let's say, that, that your brain kind of like grabs onto it. Yeah. So, is there any plans on uh, on this bringing this outfit over to uh, North America for any touring in Sector? Well, right now we don't have a U.S. booking agent, and that is, I think, the only thing that is standing in our way from immediately planning a U.S. tour. So we've been talking with people, but after spending a couple of years, um, not coming to to the States, you know, being a Europe, European based band, um, it's actually really hard right now in the yeah. US to get things for, for foreign lands. And we absolutely want to. And if you dig into statistics, it's, you know, in whatever social media and stuff, um, a lot of our fan base is in North America. And so we do want to come there, but it's mostly about trying to find somebody good to team up with to do a tour with or just uh, you know when it does happen finding a u.s agent who can put something together but the timing of things with covid were very difficult because that, that seems like distant memory for a lot of people but you know it wasn't if you only put out a record every couple of years um you know in the case of so rob blood singing came out three months ago, just a little over three months ago. The album previous to that came out in February of 2020. So, and we were on tour when COVID hit. And so that album basically died on the vine. And yeah. then I got, then I was in, you know, and I was in Europe when the whole thing, the whole world shut down. And I decided, well, you know what? I'm not coming back to America. I'm not going to live there anymore. I'm just going to stay here and like ride this out for a little bit. And of course I had to do some fast work because you know, I had an apartment and a life in New York and um, other people I knew also had the things falling apart. So I was able to get a friend to sublet my apartment in New York and I'd stayed in Germany, but uh, eventually, you know, I went back and got my stuff. But the thing that happened was, was that, you know, I basically, had to just wait until things settled down and then restarted the band right you know with tim joined and then the whole directive of the band changed and you know the singing and like everything took more time so what that meant is that we haven't we haven't done like a proper tour an insect arc u.s tour since we played with aranti pazuzu in 2019 we did a whole u.s canada tour so that's a long time um and from promoters point of view like they're pretty uh they're pretty picky about getting people who haven't been actively working on their, their audience there. so yeah it's really not an ideal situation but i'm hoping that we can get over there because you know it happens somehow yeah that was the last um well, I mean, I, I'd seen you guys play that show in Queens, and then the the Arancy Pazuzu. I was at that that gig, right? That yeah, looked awesome. That was, awesome. that was uh, yeah. yeah the second time I'd seen Arancy Pazuzu, and the first time I'd seen Insect Art was uh, mm -hmm. was at that, that night. It's awesome. Mm -hmm, yeah. So you saw one of the two shows. Yeah, Tim and I came over and did when we were still instrumental. 
And when we were like writing the music for this new album, we went to New York and we did two shows. So I guess yeah. that's, you saw one of them. Yeah. Um, but that's, you know, so, okay, we did play in North America like a couple of years ago, but it kind of doesn't count from the standpoint of a, a you know, a proper tour goes. But, um, but yeah, if any, if any people who like Insect Dark want us to do, do a tour together, please contact us because I think that's, Still, you know, as the business, the music business, which is just so uh, complex and just getting weirder every day, um, I'm finding that, you know, doing stuff in a more homegrown way, like connecting with people who have similar attitudes and, you know, making personal connections and reaching out to each other and kind of going more into like the DIY, like don't expect everything to happen through normal you know, business channels and people arrange stuff for you. It's still very much like a one-to-one -one, um, speaking to each other and, you know, brainstorming ideas. So I've always had this DIY attitude where it's like, well, you know, I don't want people making decisions for me. I want to, I want to be involved in that. So um, but yeah, hopefully, well, hopefully, you know, sometime early next year, we'll be touring the U.S. if things go the way that we're hoping. Yeah, I hope so. I definitely like to see this version of the band. So when did you get involved with, uh, with Michael Girard? Was it, was it the Angels of Light era of the band? Mm hmm Yeah, it was, um, 23 years ago when I joined yeah. Angels of Light. How did that, uh, you know, how did that come about? I mean, you know, just did, had you known him prior to that or was there some introduction or, you know, how is that whole story line? Yeah. So the story of that was that I was recognizing he was looking to put together the live band for Angels of Light. And it was right after New Mother had come out. And so that was the first Angels of Light record. Um, which, you know, for people who don't know, Angels of Light is was basically Swans. I mean, the original Angels of Light bands, band was a lot of the same people who are in Swans now or have been over the last, you know, the last years. Um, so, yeah, I guess he was looking for a bass player and some two different people he asked, suggested me. Um, I got a letter from him in the mail. Letter in the mail. Wow. Yeah, he sent me a letter, a handwritten letter, and asked me if I would be interested, and uh, we met up. So Angels of Light, when I joined, it was the tour for New Mother, which was the first album, and New Mother was made in 1999. So right after that, when he was putting the touring band together, then that's when I joined. And I got a letter from him in the mail, and a couple different people had suggested me to him so we met and it worked out and we did that first tour and then the writing sessions which was basically you know just him and then we wrote all the arrangements together in rehearsals for the album that became how i loved you which was released in 2001 and then there was um a tour that was recorded. There was a live album called We Were Alive, which was, I think, 2002. And then the material on that tour ended up becoming the material for the third album, Everything Is Good Here, Please Come Home. And after that was when I moved to Europe the first time, which was in 2004, and I left New York. And uh, we stayed in touch ever since then. Yeah, I imagine he's got a pretty uh, decent, um, you know, Rolodex of of musicians. <laughs> That's pretty awesome, though. You know, to be on that in that list, you know. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, do you know that album, How I Loved You? That's the really the only Angels of Light record that I gravitate towards. Like I ha I have them all, but that's the one I return to. You know? Yeah, there's some great songs on there, um, and the band was really really good. Um, I think I mean, it was for me, it was the point of the band that I think it was most like a band because 
the first album was a recording project, tons of guests. And he was, you know, very specifically trying to do something um, that wasn't resembling Swan. So it was quieter, it was guitar driven, it was lyric driven. Um, so How I Loved You was, you know, we had been playing together for, you know, a solid year or something like that. And after the um, Everything is Good Here, Please Come Home, which was sort of made, you know, we had done this tour leading up to that and we had written a lot of arrangements, you know, everybody in the band. And Michael decided after we recorded it that he wanted to change it and he actually uh, made us come into the studio at Martin Vesey's and re-record a lot of stuff so he could change the the vibe of the record, which was, you know, at the time upsetting. But, you know, you have to trust people to know what's right for their own music. And it was all of our music, but it's his music. And there's no question about that. And um, so that album sounded pretty different than how we had been playing the songs on the tour leading up to that. And then after that, he got Akron family uh, for, as his band and he had Devendra Banhart in there with different people. And um, I guess the last, it's like mid 2007, let's see here. Yeah, it looks like 2007, We Are Him, according to the internet, was the last Angels of Light record. and. Angels of Light now is, uh, well, I mean, basically it's Swans. It's like like myself and Larry Mullins uh, and Christoph Hahn were all in Angels of Light. As, of course, as was Michael. And um, Thor Harris was in Angels of Light. And there was a woman named Cassie Stout, and she was in Angels of Light. And there was, a, you know, a lot of people coming and going, sort of, but the core of the band was like, you know, Michael, Thor, Larry, me, and Kristoff. Yeah, I just got hit with like a really heavy wave of nostalgia. <laughs> it was like, yeah. I remember, that's like uh, early 2000s, Brooklyn, you know, like yeah. Akron family, you know, that whole that whole totally. uh, Young Gods kind of thing. And uh, yeah, I just remember buying all those records at, um, there was a record store called Permanent, Re or used to be a record store called Permanent Records in Greenpoint. Yeah, and uh, that was right around the corner from where I lived, and I was just like, I would go in there, you know, all the time, man, just looking for records. And I picked up that that whole like, there was that you know ten year period, you know, of like releases that came out, and I was into like all that stuff, man. And it was like, I don't know, I was just going back and talking about that stuff now. It's like really interesting. Yeah, yeah, the songs are really beautiful. Um... And there's some stuff there that that I remember so well, you know, even playing it live, like certain bass lines. I mean, when I was in Angels of Light, I didn't, that was before I played lap steel. So I was playing bass and I was playing keyboards sometimes and doing some backing vocals, mostly bass. And I just remember, you know, these tours we would do and, um, it felt for me, it felt really, really good because I hadn't lived in New York for that long. And I had moved from San Francisco where I come from. And, you know, pretty, pretty soon after being there, just a couple of years, you know, to, to join that band. It was a really important moment for me in my life as a musician. It gave me a lot of, um, it gave me a lot of confidence in myself to be in the midst of these these folks who were, you know, amazing musicians, great writers, really well established, and you know, bit was a bit younger than everybody, but um, you know, doing all these tours and it was a great moment. And I've always was always and continue to always be grateful to Michael for his trust and belief in me. And so when he called me to asked me if I wanted to work with Swans. Of course, I was, you know, ecstatic. Um, I mean, I remember when he told me that he was going to restart Swans. And he said, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm thinking about the lineup and I'm thinking about the bass players. And there's a pretty short list and you're on the short list. And I was like, great, you know. And when he went with Chris, Chris Pravdika, um, and then I saw them, I was like, he made the absolute right you know, right decision because Chris Pravdika is a 
monster. I mean, he's like such an incredible bass player and he's an incredible musician and, you know, a lovely person as well. Um, but, you know, I don't think that, uh, I think that he did exactly the right thing for the new Swans because it's just so, just like a volcano, you know? Um, and I really trust Michael to know what he's doing, even if I don't always agree with him. I think that he knows what he, he knows how to put together what it is that he wants to do. And you have to respect somebody who has that much clarity as, as creative people sometimes, you know, we, we second guess ourselves or whatever. And he's just really clear about his decision-making process. And I find that very refreshing because it saves some confusion, you know, as <laughs> if you wonder, you know, well, how's it going to go? He's just like, yes or no. And then you're like, all right, got it. You know? Yeah. You got to appreciate that. I think that's the downfall of, of some uh, creative uh, efforts when there's um, there has to be a guy steering the ship, you know what I mean? It's like, oh, otherwise nothing ever gets done, you know, and that's could be extreme or it could be, you know, not extreme, you know? Right. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. It's like, unless you're just a band of people who is really a democracy and everybody's just their communication is so good that they're able to you know really work it out in a way that it's really a true collaboration and there's not some people you know secretly resenting <laughs> each other because you know well you you know we're doing four of your songs and only two of mine or something like that like um but yeah, having somebody who is kind of keeping an eye on the the sort of overall shape or like the arc of the project. Um, you can't always explain why you know that something is the right way to do it, but then usually it, it makes sense eventually. You know, why somebody says like, no, like I really think you should keep that part really simple. You know, or I think that you should just go crazy in that part or whatever the, the case is. Sometimes you're like, really? And they're like, okay. I mean, with being in Swans now, sometimes it shows. He's like, just play just like insane on that part. Just make as much noise. I'm like, really? He's like, you just go. like, And he's making these faces at me, like, which when he makes that face at you means just make as much noise and make as much chaos as you possibly can. And I'm like, okay. And then you know, now hearing how it sounds recorded, I'm like, oh, I couldn't, I couldn't see the full picture, you know, yeah. at the time, but he had it in his mind. So, um, so yeah, I have nothing but respect for Michael. And uh, it's, you know, it's, of course, it's a, it's an ongoing project and it continues to, to change with each person that's involved and, um but yeah, for me, it's of course it is an honor to be in the band, and I really enjoyed playing the music, so it's it's all great. So how how did you come? How did you arrive at lap steel as an instrument? It, it's such a interesting sounding instrument to play in this context. So how how did you find that instrument? Um, a few different ways, just you know, seeing people playing slide guitar. Um, Years ago, back in San Francisco, in the in the old old days, um, I had a band called Gift Horse, which was yeah. myself and this guitar player named Doug Hillsinger, who was also my roommate, and then also Jeff Whitehead, who a lot of people know from Leviathan, the yeah. one man black metal band. So we had this band that was uh, a three piece instrumental kind of proggy band we were really influenced by king crimson and jesus lizard if you can imagine that kind of a combination i can, I can actually believe it or not yeah. i mean that's yeah, yeah. totally makes sense and, to me yeah yeah and um doug the guitar player we were roommates and he had a pedal steel and he used to get really baked in his room and play it and i was like wow that just sounds like magic like oh my god you know he was such a good guitar player i mean he is still a, such an amazing guitar player, multi-instrumentalist. And so I think that was the first time that I, I heard it at length where somebody was playing it in a non-traditional way, you know, not, not country, not Hawaiian, not, you know, 
whatever, not countries, Southern music or any of these kinds of associations that a lot of people have with that instrument. Um, and then when I started Be and Flower, I actually didn't want a guitar. I only wanted a lap steel or a, a pedal steel, but that did not happen. So Lynn, who's now the guy that is playing lap steel and insect art, he was playing, he got, he's like, well, I can play lap steel. So he played a little bit of lap steel in that band, um, which you can hear pretty prominently on the first record, which we made, which was in 2001, it came out on, uh, on Neurot recordings, actually. The album's called How I Loved You. And so he was playing lap steel on that. And so then there was that as well. And then, yeah, later, um, you know, other bands have used it. And um, when I started Insect Arc, I was like, all right, I'm going to start a solo project. I'm just going to do something by myself. I don't want it to sound like anything else. I don't want to. I don't want to lean on any anything that I can think of. And I thought, like, well, shit, like, what can I come up with? I thought, like, well, I know I'm going to play bass. And then I thought, like, well, well, what else can I play? Then I, I went to Main Drag Music in Brooklyn, and they were having a sale, and they had this, like, cheap lap steel. And I was like, oh, shit, lap steel. I love lap steel. And, you know, um, Swans had already kind of come back and Christoph Hahn was playing lap steel. Uh, you know, Christoph Korf is like a, an amazing lap steel player. And um, so he had kind of re-entered my consciousness several times. And then I thought like, all right, you know, well, I'm going to get this. It was like a hundred dollars and I got it and I took it home and I like connected it to my, my distortion pedal and my delay. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> it took a long time to, make it sound good and when I listened to the first records that I made with Insect Dark I remember like how confused it I was like playing like a six string instrument because I never played guitar playing a six string instrument fretless with open tuning so it's not even like E-A-D-G-B-E or like detuned it's like all these you know it's an open chord so yeah. So I had no, you know, I, I chose it for that because I was like, I will absolutely not be able to follow any patterns that I am comfortable with. I'm going to have to start like I've never played an instrument before, you know, because I don't know. I could sit there and be like, okay, let's see, that's a G, that's an A, that's a C, okay. And if I tune it this way, it's a C sharp and different tune. And I was like, no, I'm just going to see what I can do with this thing kind of free form and it gave me so much freedom that I really enjoyed playing music again which I had kind of stopped because I had had that band be in flower for more than 10 years and it just kind of ran its course and it was very hard to keep it going and I had lost some of my um my fire for playing so starting a solo project with an instrument that I didn't need know how to play and saying like, I'm going to do this by myself and nobody can tell me uh, that they're not available. They don't have time. Yeah. They're not, they don't like it. They, you know, they don't, I don't have to figure out are they going to make it to rehearsal or not. Like I was like, it's just me. And so I was like, yeah. So the lap steel was, you know, it was a kind of long uphill climb. And I don't, I don't consider myself like a great lap steel player, but I think I, I got much better at it over the last years and put in yeah, a lot I mean, of time, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's that's, that's a pretty cool way of getting into it because it's like completely unconventional, you know, and you're not trying to play anything traditional on it either, you know? And, no. and it's funny. I remember main drag having a couple of those back in the day. And I, yeah. was, I was so close to buying one myself to be honest, too, just to play around with it, you know? And uh, that that was a great spot, man. I used to I used to be in there all the time. We used to have a practice yeah. space around the corner from Main Drag. Yeah, the old days in Brooklyn. Those days are. I mean, when I come back there, now, like you know, we just played there with Swans. We played it, um, Music Hall of Williamsburg, and just being in. I mean, that's the neighborhood that I lived in too. And just seeing like, wow, there's like a Chanel here. There's a Prada. And there's like 
giant glass condos. I'm like, whoa, damn. Like, you know, those yeah, days of just going to, going to, you know, the all ages underground show at death by audio. And then like yeah. rolling over to, you know, to, to main drag and like buy a pedal and like hang out and end up talking for three hours to your friend that works there like those days are just you know gone where, where? You know, it all changes everything changes <laughs> absolutely yeah yeah death by audio was great that was like early that was like our first shows were played there that was um oh really yeah we had like a pretty good relationship with this one dude that uh like he booked like the, the more you know there'd be all kinds of shows there but he was more like he booked like wolves in the throne room there and he booked mm -hmm. us that kind of vibe, you know, so we were early, we kind of found our thing playing there, you know, it was kind of cool. And um, yeah, and even, even William, William the uh, music hall of Williamsburg, they used to be North Six, you know. Right, was, I remember was, that. Yeah, and it just, um, I can't, I, I it, it, it's weird going back, back there sometimes, you know, and even more so for you, I imagine, since you're coming from Germany, you know. Well, yeah, just like, you know, I saw, I mean, we all saw it coming, of course, you know, it was pretty obvious which direction it was going, but I wasn't expecting Chanel uh, <laughs> next to the venue. And that just says something about, you know, the people that live there now, like, you know, that it's just ultra wealthy people and well, that's probably their second or third condo and they only live there part of the year. And that, you know, they don't want to walk down to the bodega and get like some chips and a beer. Like they are going to pop down to the Chanel and get, you know, like a scarf or so I don't know, whatever people buy at Chanel, you know? Yeah, um, totally. And so, I mean, that's the thing that's like sort of beautiful and horrible about urban centers like New York is that they just, they keep adapting and changing and, you know, the underground gets pushed somewhere else and it's, it's going on somewhere else. And uh, maybe it's not there or maybe it's, you know, in a different part of the city, but it kind of has to shift. You know, things can't stay the same. And I mean, even in Berlin, that's been happening. It's been getting gentrified for, for years here. And it's now there's this like massive housing crisis here where pe nobody can move because there's no, there's nowhere to go. Because you can't find an apartment here. So, yeah, I feel like people have been talking about moving to Berlin for at least fifteen years. Because I remember, mm -hmm. I remember people, oh yeah, Berlin. I'm going to move to Berlin and, and do my art or something. You know what I mean? And there was this big vibe, like I said, like maybe fifteen years ago, about everyone. Uh, yeah, you know, it's cheap to live there. I'm gonna, you know, I'm like, okay, let's see how long that lasts. You know, it lasted a long time. I mean, when I moved to Berlin the first time in 2004. Um, you could get a one bedroom apartment for three hundred a month. Wow! For the whole apartment, so totally normal. Absolutely. And it was not; it wasn't hard to find that. I mean, it might not have uh, central heating like a lot of those apartments had. Literally, they had coal ovens in them. Wow! You know, people people laughed at me when I told them. I was like, "No, you don't understand. Like, that you literally heat your apartment with coal. It's like you know." But um, but now your average apartment, you know, in the same neighborhood where you used to be able to find a 300, your apartment is now, you know, 1800. So, and it's not that long, like 20 years, you know. So the people who had the means and were clever bought apartments back then. I was not one of them, but, you know. Were those uh, types of spots on the, on the eastern side of the city? No, everywhere. Really? interesting yeah yeah everywhere i mean certainly not in the more you know fancier neighborhoods but no it was i mean back then like 500 would have gotten you like a like a two two bedroom apartment two or three bedroom apartment maybe with two bathrooms you know it's like really nice with a balcony <laughs> it's just a totally different scene i mean it's just a lot of people came here a lot of people are like, hey, it's great. It's like living in London or like living in Paris. But it's, you know, it's just way more affordable. Uh, and there's a lot of benefits to living here. I mean, it's not perfect. And there's a lot of crazy stuff that happens here, just like everywhere. And there's a lot of, you know, 
the same issues that people are dealing with all over Europe are happening here. And there's nationalism and there's immigration problems and there's, um, you know, pollution and there's just, you know, all the same, all the crazy stuff with politics. Um, but overall, it is still a quite livable place. I'm a big fan of Germany. I, I really do like, I mean, in general, I like going to Germany, but in Berlin and Hamburg and those places are awesome. Cologne. I love yeah. Cologne. My best friends lives in Cologne. It's um, oh, nice. Yeah. Such a, I love, I, I actually, um, we I have plans to, to go to Cologne in uh, December for, uh, there's a festival out there on Holy oh. Passion, which um, not are you 100%. Trying? I, I am performing. Uh, well, I'm not going to say anything. It's supposed to be a surprise, but uh, Oh, you just said it. I just said it. And so <laughs> I'll, have to, I'll have to edit that part out. But um, Oops. it's not um it's not it's not a uh it's not a hundred percent right now, but I went a couple years ago and performed and it was fun. It was great. And my one of my best friends is the curator of it. And uh it's just a fun time, man. And I I, I just love Cologne. You know, you know the, it's a different city because you know it's closer to holland to that sort oh yeah of influence and everything and yeah i just i, I really you know i i feel fortunate that i do have like great friends in germany too that I could always go and visit berlin's also a great city and you know, i love hamburg mm -hmm. hamburg is weird and dirty in a new york kind of way you know oh yeah well yeah because hamburg is really uh you know it's a port city and it kind yeah. of reminds me of amsterdam in the way that it's really transient you know, there's a lot of people coming and going. There's a lot of people traveling there just for business. Um, so it has this sense of just, you know, like nothing is sitting still at all. People are just kind of like moving. Yeah, and that's why it has to me. Yeah, it has like that, like old New York vibe too, because everything's mm -hmm. just constantly in motion and everything stays yeah. open. There's like a 24-hour vibe in that city, you know? Yeah, definitely. When is that festival? Uh December seventh, that weekend. Oh. Like two yeah. You should so, come down to Berlin and hang out. I'll be here still. I'm gonna go to the US later in the year, but um I will still be here. Possible. I mean I plan in if if it does have form, if it does come together, I'll probably try to stay over there for about a week or so. So maybe do a little travel. Nice. Yeah, we're going to be, Insect Arc has a show in Vienna on the 1st, but um, then I'm coming back. Dana, thank you very much for your time. You're very generous with your time. And, uh, you know, we should do this again at some point, definitely. Absolutely. Yeah, it's great to catch up with you. And I can you tell me before we sign off what's going on with your music projects and your tunes and everything? I'll tell you after we sign off, because I actually want to talk to you like five more minutes about that. that okay, that's of... fine. Yeah, for sure. All right, guys. Thank All right, you well, thanks. Listening. Thanks. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's great to chat.